Hi friends, host Eric here, host talking with the best people. I'm here with Josh, I'm here with the Arch Admin. Kizzin, 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 Ken is here. Kestrel GTX, nah, -uh, fuck that noise. And also the bot, of course. Um, and so I would like to talk today about objectivity, subjectivity, <laughs> realism, and the reality of assorted metrics. And the reason I'm making this video is in response to this comment here. Now, I don't exactly remember what I said in this video, the case for nihilism, the problems therewith. But this is what Tashim Hargrove says. Causality. Just because an imaginary concept causes something to happen doesn't make it that concept any less imaginary. For example, the Muslim terrorists who committed the Charlie Hebdo shooting a couple years were operating from the moral belief that it is wrong to mock Muhammad. Their belief in this moral claim is one of the causes. Does this make it objectively true? Of course not. Well, okay. First of all, to say that are you reading? Yeah, I'm reading this comment, paragraph by paragraph, and could you put it up again? What's that? Could you put it? Is it the same thing you had up before? Yeah, I'll put it up again. Or here. Okay. Here's a link. All right. Oh, did you already put it, Susie? Yeah, that's the one. Oh, okay, cool. I will put it. So anyway, um, let's start by just saying this. First of all, their belief didn't cause anything. What happened was their pulling triggers caused people to die. Because that's a behavior in the physical world. Causality doesn't exist in the metaphysical world. It, it exists, the metaphysical world exists in conditionality, which is different. So, that's just one of the things here about this comment. Objectively true. Of course not. Well, okay, let's talk about what objectivity and subjectivity actually mean. Yeah. To say something's objective means that you're going to... Okay, well, let's backtrack a little further. First, note that all statements have truth value. True, false, or no truth value. And thus, we understand that all understanding comes through this process of determining whether we're making a position statement, expressing a preference, or something else. Now, there really aren't any other kind of statements, per se, except for like aphorisms and metaphors that may not be anything. But the point being, what you're doing here is you're saying, I present for you an argument. And that's what everybody does. The thing is, whether or not your argument is objective or subjective depends on whether the points you're making or the position statements you're establishing are subject to scrutiny from external parties. And that what makes it objective is the fact that you're talking about an object external, so others can reference it as well. Now, if I make a statement about um, my feelings, I feel very sad, it has a truth value due to true or false, but it's not something that any other party can challenge because or the source of the the evidence for me feeling sad is accessible only to me. I mean, you might point out that I'm Eric sad because you see that I'm crying or something, but and that would be trying to make my emotions objective, which is to say, you too can reference this data and draw conclusions about it. Okay, so the notion that things exist objectively or subjectively outside of argumentation is complete nonsense. All statements are arguments. The things that are not arguments are commands and questions. So when you're making arguments, you are necessarily engaging in either an objectively ascertainable argument chain, an objectively um, evaluate, evaluatable, evaluatable uh, sort of position statement or you're making one that's not 
And that's the difference between subjectivity and objectivity is simply, are you presenting this as universalizable that others can scrutinize it and find it consistent with generally agreed upon axioms or not? So, in other words, ahead, Josh. Empirical, do you believe in empirical data? Well, okay, let's, let's get to that. Empirical data is necessarily processed for intentionality. In other words, nobody seeks out data for no reason. So because data is used for things, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's used to substantiate claims that are made, that are asserted to be objective, namely that others can scrutinize the reason. And so that's what data, because data doesn't exist in a vacuum and we tend to isolate, objectivity means isolating the position statement from the individual making it. So that their intentionality, their emotional state, blah, 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 is irrelevant to the evaluation of it. However, that doesn't change the fact that intentionality exists and that the data that is being presented as here's, some, here's something you should agree with. And the reason you should agree with it is because it's substantiated with data from a third party who themselves presented it for objective analysis. And it has withstood scrutiny heretofore. Therefore, if you're going to scrutinize something, then they should scrutinize something else other than this piece of evidence. Scrutinize my logic, scrutinize my, um, you know, or, or make, turn it. And there's lots of different things you can do to, to answer any kind of argument. But um, one thing that a good, per, a person making good arguments does is reference data that's not in any dispute because it's too high, too steep of a rhetorical hill. And ultimately that's what, what argumentation is all about. It's about the steepness of a rhetorical hill. So the point is these people who committed the Charlie Hebdo shooting have an extremely steep rhetorical hill to claim any kind of objectivity because to do so, they have to go, they have to process things through, a process, through the mechanism of reciprocal burden. That is to say, if it's okay for you to justify shit like this, then it's okay for me to justify shit like this because reciprocal burdens means that we are talking about objectivity, namely my personal feelings aren't the reason why this is justified. It's from something that you can scrutinize as well. So this guy says here, it's the same reason most, pe most humans prefer the belief that the earth is flat and the sun revolves around it, society and culture. There's nothing inherent, so there's no natural forces creating the bias. It's simply human ignorance to ignore to objective reality. Again, reality is not objective. You're making statements. Remember that. You cannot talk about objectivity or reality or human ignorance or natural forces or bias or things that are inherent without making claims. And to try to divorce reality from language is to try to, to divorce the shell, the feet, and the water from the turtle. It, it doesn't make any sense at all. And... Just to, okay, so if it's not objective, then it is not possible to do any better with speaking language to currently regarded moral issues. Well, that's true. If, in other words, if you're not presenting your morality as, as universalizable, if you're not saying there's objective reasons to believe my moral claims, then it's, you're saying there are subjective reasons to uh, believe my moral claims. If you're saying there are objective moral reasons, there are objective reasons to believe my moral claims, then it should be subject to reciprocal burdens as a test. And it's not, therefore it's not objective. That's entirely dependent on your wants and goals. If you want a generally safer world for humans, then the person who does the murdering should receive a harsh punishment. I'm not talking about punishment at all. I'm talking about moral agency. And it's not based on wants and goals. It's based on the fact that a, a, decent, a decent normative model passes a reciprocal burdens test. Are you a Kantian? Am I what? Are you, do, are you a Kantian? Do you, do you describe the Kantian theory? Uh, yeah, I would Ethics? Say I, I'm a deontologist for sure. I mean, but the thing is, I'm, I'm a person who describes, if I have to ascribe my position, it's, it's to a negative right framework, which is a little bit different than a Kantian framework because it understands uh, that there are legitimate uses of force that are responsive and that people forfeit their rights when they engage in transgression, and that justifies use of force against them. So, in that regard, I'm not exactly a Kantian. Because Kant's position is, 
that, that the agents are engines themselves and that to to use punishment or to use use force at all that is to reduce that other individual to a means to an end in other words to an instrumental good rather than a than an absolute value the thing is each of us has this built into us a notion of what's instrumental and what's an end what's a means and what's an end for me for example pe is a means not an end and it's a means to enabling me to more freely do p-i-n-e stuff um, or it's a, it's a means to impress my woman or whatever i don't know it's it's like it's not a value in and of itself but um okay well, define, uh, uh, he quotes again, if it's just subjective, do you ever complain when something bad happens to you? This is unfair. Well, define unfair. If I think it's unfair, okay, well, see, this is the thing. My point is, the definition of unfair is universal. It's that your behavior does not pass the reciprocal burdens test. That you're justifying behavior that's transgressive against another in ways that you would not accept the equivalent justification were I to transgress against you and and that, and that most importantly disinterested parties wouldn't accept it such as American hegemony well American hegemony is not is not really a thing per se it's it's instead a political perspective that is embraced by by a lot of people who who understand the the supremacy of a of a of a free society. Ideal. There's no disputing that a free society is better than an autocratic one. However, she cannot impose. What's failed to understand when people advocate for hegemony is that is that it's it's not about what's a desirable outcome. See, that's a TE framework. It's like, well, we know what the best ends are, so. We're not going to care about the means. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that fails to pass the reciprocal burdens test, and we have not been transgressed upon. We, we, nobody's forfeit their rights, therefore, and we can't transgress upon others. At the bottom line, we are individuals who have to take individual responsibility for our moral agency, and governance in general tries to disperse out that agency and that responsibility so that no individual maintains actual responsibility for their actions that's why when a cop pulls you over he doesn't think gosh i'm transgressing upon the rights of this individual who's failed to transgress upon anybody else's rights he thinks i'm just doing my job i'm just doing my job is a sentence that says i don't retain any moral agency i am not responsible for my actions it's like the um what was that test they did um in the 70s where they had the people that were um yeah. yeah. Okay. So, when you say, "Well, define what about natural inequalities?" What if I think it's unfair you learn quicker than I do, or you're taller? Does my complaint matter here matter? Well, it depends what you want it to do, I suppose. But the point is, you can claim it's unfair, but you need to have some sort of understanding of what that means. Does it afford some sort of status? Does it justify some sort of behavior? That's the thing. You're establishing. You're trying to establish a position here, and the fact that that your subjective understanding of what's unfair or fair isn't objective is definitionally so and not really saying anything. All right, so I think self-preservation and empathy are two very real things. I agree with you. And I think that's where morality comes from. That's not what we're talking about. You want to be just treated fairly and you want someone not to murder you simply because of an inherent drive for self-preservation. We also want to prevent these things because we have an inherent capacity for empathy. We can relate to our fellow human and sometimes animal as well as put ourselves in their shoes and understand their hurt and hardship. But beyond these inherent capacities, there is nothing to deal with. And probably the best way to know whether something is objectively true is to see how the natural world or our reality reacts to this something. Rather, does it react itself? But why? Why should we prefer that, that moral actions take have impact on things other than people? I mean, the thing is, you're saying if, if it's real, if morality is real, the natural world will behave differently if I behave immorally? No, because... You're failing to distinguish between the metaphysical and physical worlds. 
So the fact is, you state here that beyond, but beyond these inherent capacities, there is nothing, just nihilism. Okay, well, that's a, that's a claim. It's a claim that invalidates stuff that clearly exists, such as arguments uh -oh. in favor of moral agency. It's not responsive to any arguments in favor of moral agency. It's an unsubstantiated claim. It's subjective. Now, when you say there's nothing else beyond our natural inclinations towards moral agency born of self-preservation and empathy, that's not an argument for your side. That's an argument for my side. So my position is that humans are fundamentally, above and beyond all else, moral agents, and our fail to behave accordingly is indicative of our imperfections. But do you believe in altruism? Do I believe in what? Do you believe in altruism? I mean, I don't believe it's morally obligatory. It. I it's do you believe that it's true? Is it, is it an actual um, um, construct of, of, of humanity? Do you believe? Do you believe that altruism is uh, a moral um, faculty or um, uh, 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 um, uh, a way, a means to not feel bad if you do something, if you don't do something right for someone, or to feel good if you do something good for someone? I, I think altruism. Is I, I don't believe. I personally don't believe in altruism. I believe that we do be good for people I believe it because. Is. I, I do. I, I don't. I believe that altruism is is fake. I believe that we do things good for people because, for two reasons, either a, we don't want to feel bad. <laughs> Damn you! <laughs> we don't want to feel bad because uh, we don't do something good for someone. And obviously, the Adderall's kicking in on you. I can tell. And um, or, or b, that we want to feel good because we do something good for someone. I believe that altruism is not. Altruism is fake and it is selfish. Okay, but see, that assumes that one's definition of altruism that it necessarily doesn't have any benefits to the self. But I think that's an unfair definition of altruism. I want to talk about an episode of Father Knows Best that I saw. It's like the only episode I've ever seen. I saw it not that never... long ago when I had antenna TV only. And Did he know that? And in this, they're having this very same argument about whether anybody actually has character or whether they are just doing it to make themselves feel better. There's really a self-interest motivation behind everything. Oh, yeah, there is. In this episode, Father has hired a painter to paint the house, and he's trying to prove to the kids that, in fact, people have character. And he's got this old guy as the painter, and he says, now look at old Mr. Jenkins there. He has... He has pride in his work. So I'm going to prove something to you. I'm going to ask him a question and we'll see what he says. And so he goes out and says, hey, uh, Mr. Jenkins, you know what? I think I'm going to sell this house pretty quick after you paint it. I wonder if there's some sort of cheap paint we could put on where it it won't last very long, but it'll be good enough to get, just get the house sold. And then Mr. Jenkins is like, no. Yeah, there's, there's such a thing exists. I could do that for you. But he doesn't look happy about it. Okay. Now, the sad thing is, I didn't see the end of the episode, so I don't know what happens. But the point is, uh, it is true that people have pride, have pride to do things well and have an inherent desire to do things well that goes beyond self-interest, but rather is is consistent with their own understanding of the good that, um, that comprises who they are rather than what they want. It's, so it's it's basically it's 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 a it's a it's a pride issue. I mean, look, I'm willing to concede that altruism all all boils down to self interest. It's not it's not a critical point to me because what I do believe wholeheartedly is that altruism is not a moral issue. That it's it's um it's a liberty issue. Do I have the liberty to help others as I see fit? Sure. Am I morally obligated to help anybody with altruism? No. Absolutely not. It's morally permissible, therefore morally irrelevant. It's neither prohibited nor obligatory. So, I mean, I'm not very altruistic. But I am. I am very altruistic, but I understand that I'm being self selfish when I do it. I recognize that fact. I mean, I could frame things, certain things, as altruistic, I suppose. But 
I mean, I've given away my last dollar to, to a homeless person and suffered because of it. And, but it was not because I wanted to, I, I would rather have had my money. I wanted my money, but I would have felt terrible had I not given it to the homeless person. And, 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 and I felt good because I did do it and I suffered because of it, but I stopped in Arizona to fill up on gas, and there was a Mexican couple there standing next to a an old vehicle, and they had a gas can in their hand. And after I filled up, they're like, "Hey, can can you put a little bit of gas in this for us too?" And so I I was just like, "Of course." Yeah, if you extra bucks, yeah. Of course I will. I filled up their gas can, and I think I filled up a second one for them. And you felt great because of it. You know, I, I didn't really think about it afterwards. I felt bad, if anything, because that's the thing about altruism. If people are in need, it makes me feel awful. I always yeah. think, there before the grace yeah. of God go I, because I have no business being anything but homeless. And in the I don't either. <laughs> except for the care of the my parents and the people who've been around me who have who have not let me fall into a pit of of what do you call it despair despair or or giving up oh, hopeless surrender a pit of surrender where you say fuck it this life's over there's no point I, I've been there before I was at that point before I quit drinking too it was like it's too late for me. I just, I'm just, yeah, just waiting to drink until I die. I'm waiting to drink my death to death. How old are you, Eric? I'm 40, About 45. 46. No, 46. I'm 38. Well, I'll be 38 in June. You're young. Um, yeah. Like I don't feel it. This morning, I went outside and smoked a cigarette. And this guy came up and he looked a little bit like not supposed to be at the hotel, I guess. And uh, he kind of nodded at me and got really like closed in. And and then he, he went in the hotel and he came back out like five minutes later with a cup of coffee and a newspaper. And he walked away. So it was like a, a homeless guy who came in to get a free cup of coffee and a free newspaper. And, you know, obviously I didn't begrudge him any of that. I didn't you know, say, hey, what are you doing or anything like that. But it just made me right. feel bad. It only made me feel bad. I avoid altruism because it makes me feel bad. I, I go, t I, I, I leap towards altruism because it makes me feel good, and that's selfish. But I cannot stand to see someone suffering. I cannot stand to see it. It makes me sick. It, 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 and and I will suffer. I will suffer to help someone because it makes me feel good okay, to do so. I bet, I bet you're like me. I'd much rather avoid looking at the suffering than I would like to solve it. Yeah, and I, I my friends, all my friends will always tell me, you, you're fucking stupid. They're going to go buy alcohol. I, 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 li I live in, I, I used to live in downtown Richmond, Virginia. I live in the, the suburbs now. But I had three um, guys, um, three older uh, men that um, were uh, Vietnam vets, homeless. And um, the cops would always run them off um, from the shady area where they would sit. So I would let them come sit up on my front porch. I'd give them peanut butter and crackers and, and vitamins. And I'd buy them beer and cigarettes sometimes. And um, I, I could not stand to see them suffering and and it made me feel sick but it made me feel great to help them it was like a high i like it i get high when i help somebody and well, uh, i i get your point here on altruism i want to finish this we're almost down to the bottom here it says here um basic mathematics is objectively real when there's a forest of 600 trees and you cut down 400 nature will always leave you with two understanding although the linguistics here isn't actually objective two doesn't have to mean two but that's another issue Gravity is another example of an objective truth. It doesn't matter what we believe or whether we know it exists even. Nature acts as if there is such a thing as gravity. Well, 
what I would say about all of that is that's not another issue. It's exactly the issue you're dealing with here. If I cut if there's 600 trees and I cut down 400 in base 10, it means one thing. In base two, it means another thing. If it's binary, you know, 10 means means two. 10 means whatever we fucking right. say it. And when you say here, it doesn't matter whether or whether we believe or whether we even know it exists. Nature acts as if there's such a thing as gravity. The thing is, you're making claims. Nature isn't doing anything. Gravity is not an example of an objective truth. Your claim might be an example of an objective truth, except it's not because it's false. Um, like time. It doesn't matter whether we believe or whether we even know it exists. Nature acts as if there is such a thing as gravity. In other words, we don't fly off into space. That's a true statement. It doesn't change anything that I'm saying about objectivity and subjectivity. It, it, it's, tr it's a true statement because... It's a very steep rhetorical hill to invalidate it, but it doesn't mean it can't be invalidated. Well, physics may work differently um, a few light years away from us than it works here. Well, regardless, that's not even the point. The point is the, the realities of the objective world are only understood through our own manifestation of ourselves through time. In other words, we create the realities we exist in rather than exist in the realities and then create ourselves, which is what most people believe. Well, by our five senses and the way our brain perceives them. Well, because there's a distinction between the physical and metaphysical world such that once something is rendered into the physical world, it shifts from conditionality to causality, so time only moves in one direction. In the conditional world, time moves in both directions. So I can do a conditionality statement. Well, if it's the case that cats love cheese, and it's the case that that dog's a cat, then it's the case that that dog loves cheese, it's absolutely valid, even though it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's valid is because validity, unlike truth, is a function of grammar. It's not a function of content. And the reason we know that there is an objective reality at all, which is to say that there is a way to talk about things that makes, makes them evaluable by other people, is the fact that we can make statements about it and and those statements can be scrutinized and, and the thing is if i'm making a statement that i want you to agree with then i need to translate it into a form that allows you to engage with it and understand how it's relevant to you and that's why um trying to remove objectivity and subjectivity from language is ridiculous and nonsense and makes no sense at all Maybe we've evolved to desire a world which we do not have, a moral world, but that doesn't mean we actually do live in that kind of world. I never said we do live in that kind of world. I'm not saying that people behave morally all the time. I'm saying that we can evaluate many kinds of actions on a moral framework, and, and that the moral framework is objective insofar as it's about transgression. We can define transgression straightforwardly enough. It, it, I mean, the thing is, it's about consistency. Do we have a normative framework that's consistent or not? Do we have a normative framework that's universalizable or not? Do we have a normative framework that others can evaluate and apply a reciprocal burdens test or not? All right. The last thing I want to do on this topic before we close this video out, or I get comments from others before we close the video out, is I want to go over this thing here, which is particularism and universalism. So if you want to f translate it into cognitive functions, TESE impacts locally to attain individual wants. TESE legitimizes through actualized impact. Causality equals space objects plus conditionality. Interested parties determine legitimacy for particularist metrics. FISE, significance and communica communicability are inverse. In other words, the more strong your personal individual feelings are, the less communicatable they are. Oh, yeah. And that's why... Um, F-I-S-E is the cognitive methodology of subjectivity. F-I-S-E legitimacy is the strength or depth of the feeling or impact. A particularist uh, epistemological action pair is S-I. <coughs> first or second slot means S-E builds the self. In other words, executing the, pre the already decided course of action builds the self. S-I equals knowledge to personal experience. Now, now let's go over the universalizable stuff. 
the universalist metric in action pairs are TI and E, and it universalizes through analogy. TI and E legitimizes through consistency. Consistency is an emergent function of grammar, not of content. I mean, actually, that's not true. It's an emergent function of grammar and diction. That's a little reductive. All right, disinterested parties determine legitimacy. This is the crit critical interest. I mean, this is the critical point. Objectivity and subjectivity can be boiled down to who determines legitimacy. Is it interested parties or disinterested parties? FE, NE, significance and communicability are proportional. So for FE, the more significant the FE impact is, the more, ab more abundantly oh, clear it is to, to third parties. And so you have to be able to communicate your FE concerns or else they don't have any significance. FE, NE, legitimacy is breadth of consensus and impact rather than strength or depth. And the universalist epistemology action pairs NI, NE, NI in the first or second slot means that NE universalizes itself. No, not universalizes, it builds. Stupid Eric. <laughs> My old philosophy teacher, I'm 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 pretty mixed up. He called me an, an epistem a Socratic epistemological subjectivist. Where the fuck? I mean? I yeah. Is knowledge through understanding externally. In other words, whereas SI understands it through personal experience, NI understands the way that the systems work in ways that that allow them to have insights as to like what's going to play. You know, what's going to play or how it, a given action is going to impact the system. Stuff like how that. it works practically. Well, I mean, how it, works, how it works in the general world as opposed to just through you. So particularism and universalism are the same as subjectivity and objectivity. The West frowns upon subjectivity as weakness, and the subjective are more likely to denounce their own metrics than to defend them. After all, it's an unfair way to decide any policy that affects others. One has a hard time advocating when you use a criterion that says, because I feel like it, when making decisions that impact lots of people beyond the self. That impact beyond the self. Almost nothing we do is to make actual public policy, but that doesn't mean that we don't make and justify claims to and about others. The communicability of the warrants for those claims is the attribute that makes a given justification universalizable. Well, it may be true that this time Mary feels really, really sad and so we should accommodate her. There's just no meaningful way for her to communicate how or why her extreme sadness better warrants than less extreme sadness. When does regular sadness pass the threshold? Can my extreme sadness justify stuff too? Can we verify your sadness is really extreme? That's what makes F-I-S-E-T-E -E, um, S-I useless uh, particularist individualist and so that explains particularism and universalism in uh, in terms of cognitive functions. And uh, anybody else want to comment on this? I I, I struggle. I mean, I'm I I I'm, 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 I I struggle with objectivity and subjectivity um, because I realize that, like I said, we have five senses and they're interpreted by our brain. And what I see is blue. You may see is orange. Whatever. But I do believe highly in, 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 in objectivity um, based on, 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 on um, real life examples and consistency uh, with um, um, real life um, examples. Okay. Um, What's odd is that objectivity is a metaphysical status that you afford to things on the basis of their physical reality being impactful in ways that can't be disputed. Well, I've, I've coined a term called objective subjectivity. <laughs> I, I it doesn't make much sense, but um, I I understand I understand that we each we we all bring in um um, um everything through subjective um, means of our senses, our our sight, our 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 tongues, our, our nose, our skin, um, and our ears, and the. Well, I mean, like you said, like I mean, I mean, I mean, with, with gravity, gravity, you could you could argue is an objective truth um, because it happens. 
every time. Well, I mean, you could argue, but you could argue that I have a long history of not flying off into space. You could argue exactly. That one can infer gravity from that and define it as as what we define it as, but it doesn't make gravity anything until we name it, understand it, and relate it to other things. Gravity. And also, it also may not be constant until Isaac Newton came up with it. And it also may not be a constant. Right. The point is, yep. it's, it's, gravity may end tomorrow, it's, and we wouldn't. Saying, basing an argument on the fact that gravity exists is a good way to avoid having your warrant challenged. It's difficult to challenge that gravity exists, or that people. It's difficult to make the claim that people do consistently fly off into space. So, as a consequence, you can say, that's good substantiation for an argument. That's all you can say about it. It's really good substantiation for an argument. It's a steep rhetorical hill to defeat that warrant. Mm -hmm. It's not an objective fact that there's gravity. It's a, it's a good, solid warrant for an argument if you want to use one that doesn't get your warrant challenged. That's it. It's a belief that is typical, basically. I mean, it's no, it's not it's a more than that. It's, it's, a it's, to, it's to, defeat, to defeat claims that are based upon the notion that gravity exists is to open yourself up to reciprocal burdens challenges that say, okay, but then if if we if you win the point on the fact that gravity doesn't exist, then I also get to use the fact that gravity doesn't exist to make these following points. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the problem people face is that reciprocal burdens always destroys them if they are. If they are making, if they are making claims that are warranted subjectively, that is to say, in ways that can't be verified or evaluated by others, which is which is why we have um, language. Well, I mean, we have language to do two things. We have language to express our individual wants and needs, and we have language to explain why things are justified or not justified, and. Um, you know, like PEFI, it goes, well, but I really want this. And then it finds ways to make it happen. Whereas uh, NETI goes, uh, here's some possibilities, and I'd rather not make any of them happen. I'd like to just sit here in metaphysical land and just and wait. Them. Yeah, and wait and see what happens. Test, test, test your, your theories. I mean, what, what, what we're doing right now is is something that is purely metaphysical action, even though it requires a physical component, everything does. That's why everybody has three physical or and one physical or vice versa, three metaphysical, one physical function, is because you have to have one to link you down to the other modality. Humans are both mental and physical beings. And yep. so as a consequence, when we when you're primarily metaphysical, like INTPs and ENTPs, this this constitutes action. We're doing. I, we're, we are acting right now. We are causing great impacts upon the conditionality web that we're all engaged in. But that doesn't mean we're causing great impacts in the world. And to the extent that this does cause impacts in the world, they're going to primarily be discursive, and or potentially maybe someday financial. I would love for talking sense people to make some money. That'd be nice. Instead of cost. Yeah, I mean, I to make money off of what I do, but, but uh, you, you know, it's like I'm so metaphysical. But even though I'd love that. Fucking Courtney, stop calling me. Um, what was I gonna say? I've been up all night. Um, um, shit, I forgot. Okay, well, don't stress about that. What I'm the takeaway from all of this is I appreciate Tashim Hargrove all the time he put into this comment. And I think I did the comment justice by reading it out loud and making a video about it. I sometimes feel guilty. This is a, a, mor a morality thing a bit. Like, I just wanted to dismiss this whole thing because, because of FE reasons. You know, he, he rolls in trying to assert dominance here. He doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. <laughs> he misinterpreted everything I said. But, <clears throat> good. Good. Good job, dude. Good job trying to roll in and assert dominance. You failed, but I appreciate the effort. <laughs> I do. Wait, what? Where'd you go? I'm talking about the FE component. Eric. Component. Oh, have I disappeared? So what I was 
saying before I apparently disappeared was that so I believe that comment to be a an FE thing mostly. It's it's a way of of establishing of taking down taking down Mr. Too Big for his britches a notch, namely me, and of asserting one's own intellectual vigor for himself. And I would say that the point to be taken from you, I did not mention your motivations. I did not mention what I believe to be your actual, the actual cause of that comment, which is a dance of dominance thing. Are, are, you, are you are you talking about uh, intellectual vigor coming from a feeler? No, I'm saying, I'm saying that what this comment that this guy made is about is such a long comment. It's so big, and it's challenging what I say and the way it's challenging it. It suggests to me that the primary motivation for this comment was actually fe. He's trying to do a dance of dominance thing. He's trying to take me down a notch. Yada yada yada. It's a it's a hierarchy relationship thing but the point i'm making is that i did not bring this up as an argument against anything you said tashim i bring it up at the end only to point out the fact that i didn't bring it up as an argument against anything you said because regardless of your motivations and regardless of your emotional state you have and everybody has a reasonable expectation that your claims be responded to on point and one thing that drives me fucking crazy is when people talk about my emotional state. Well, but you're so upset, Eric. Okay, and... And how does that affect you? No, I'm saying I'm so upset, but you're not responding to the claims I'm making or the statements I'm making. You're responding to my tone or how I'm presenting them. Right. I did not do that to you, Tashim. And the reason I did not do that to you is because... That's subjective. That's real subjectivity. Saying that your emotional state means I can invalidate your claims. I can't invalidate your claims by your emotional state because your claims are words that we can look at in in the actual world. We can all look at and we can make comments upon them. Rendering your positions into statements is a way that you can detach from yourself the criticisms that you're giving to something or the affirmation you're giving to something such that it's not about you anymore it's about the thing outside of you and thus in order to respond to those claims we need to respond with things outside of us not with presumptions about how you feel and that's part of being a moral agent in my opinion is like here's a here's an example of something like altruism that is important I try to remember and I'm not very consistent about it necessarily I try to remember that that I have a responsibility to be fair be fair which means to apply reciprocal burdens to myself as well more so than other people do because I'm genuinely much much more detached from any position than you don't want to be anybody i've ever met frankly so um the position i'm trying to say here hashim is that i want you to be intellectually engaged in the fashion that you are and i approve wholeheartedly of it i believe in the power of a discursive modality that affects not just what people believe not directly what people believe at all it affects who they are and their understandings of metacognition such that they generate their own unavoidably necessary improvements in their cognition. Remember, I'm 46 years old. I'm guessing you're younger than that, Hashim. And remember also that I'm a professional debate coach. So I have an advantage in terms of understanding how claims work, statements work, and argumentation works. I also yes, understand do. that being a debate coach means I'm going to tend to frame things in that fashion. I find it a particularly useful and compelling way to explain things because most people are very attached to their positions and in debate we have to argue both sides at all times and so I, uh, I'm very very detached from my positions I love being proven wrong I love it it, it is it's candy to me because the idea of me spreading misinformation is 
it kills me to think about it. Well, I, I, I argue points to other people because I'm not sure myself. Right. And you, you get what I'm saying? That's I a mean, very I just, ENTP style approach, though. Like it, it's, ENTPs it, are famous for disputing it until they've run out of disputes and then going, oh, okay, cool, well, you're right then. Well, you just I, spent the I, last 45 minutes arguing against me. I know, and it was still scrutiny, so you're right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a sufferer of the, of the, of the TI SI loop, as they say. I, I have to have everything, everything concrete, everything conclusive, everything um, consistent, and any inconsistency just destroys me until I can find some sort of clarity. And I find that clarity by trying to have arguments with people civil arguments, which is really difficult to find um, because most everyone I know is a feeler. Everyone in my family is a feeler. And they argue from their emotions and they don't listen to reason. And they it always devolves into, well, we'll just have to agree to disagree. And, and that's, I guess, their way of being diplomatic or whatever they think it is. But it, 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 it just destroys me. I, I, I... Okay, well, I mean, the thing is, yeah, agree to disagree drives me insane too. Because if you're disagreeing with me, you're making claims. If you're, you're disagreeing not with me and making logic, claims, if you're disagreeing with me making claims, then you better be have a claim of your own. Hopeful that I scrutinize your claims and point out where they're inconsistent. Otherwise, don't fucking make them. I, I mean, I, I use, I, I, I go Socratic on everyone. I, I make them agree with 10 or 15 points and that they cannot possibly disagree with. That's and then when we get to the end, then we get, when we get to the end, I, I, I load them all together and I prove them wrong and then they get pissed. But that's and, not Socratic though. I, I, that, what you're doing is called penning them down, penning them down and working and, and tossing them in the wood chipper. That's fine, and that's glorious and wonderful. And I like that's one of my favorite activities as well. Pen those fuckers down and toss them in the wood chipper. Great. But when you realize but they're wrong. Socratic. <laughs> Socratic when they, when is you ask wrong. questions to help them come up to their own conclusions that's equal to the one you want, which is fucking stupid. The Socratic method is the stupidest pedagogy I've ever heard of. Mm. I know. I'm the teacher. I know shit. So to teach it to you, I'm going to ask you questions about what you don't know. That's fucking moronic. Are you forgetting this is a video? No, I remembered. <laughs> I'm, I'm remembering. I, my point is to link it back in. Imagine if I responded to Tashim Hargrove by just asking him a bunch of questions. Well, that wouldn't be very responsive. And um, I believe in responsiveness. I believe in responding to the warrant, responding to the impact, responding to the fucking claim. And don't avoid it. If you're going to agree to disagree, I don't agree to disagree. I agree mm -hmm. that you're wrong, you stupid fucking bitch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. tell me why you're right. And if you don't tell agree, me then don't make claims. If you're making claims out in the world that apply to other people, then they are subject to scrutiny. And if that fail to meet that scrutiny, they feel, fail to withstand that scrutiny intact, then you deserve to have your words shoved right back up your ass with reckless abandon. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. um, just as happened to my friend here, Tashim Hargrove. Um... He had his words. I took them. I crumbled them up. They were kind of crinkly and pointy in that point spots. And I didn't even use any lube. I just shoved them right back up his ass where they belong. Oh, man, you should have. Yeah. Yeah. No so, astral life for Tashim. The moral of this story, Tashim, is good job with a big, long comment. Good job engaging intellectually. Good job. Job with your grandma. Your, and good job taking your beating like a man. Thanks for watching Talk with Famous People. And do not forget, for God's sake, this time, I'm so sick of telling you people, do not forget to eat plenty of cheese.